25 years of growing the business. I always hear, and you know, I'm never confrontational. I'm sure everybody here will tell you that. But I, I always hear that we're trying not to tax anybody but the people that make over that 250000 that elitist 2%. Any viable, strong, competitive business, and the name of our business is Competitive Edge, 30 years ago before CNN ever used it as a term, the, uh, the hope is that you know, you're supposed to grow profitability so you can grow your business. When I went in as a young man at 25 and said, how about a bank loan? There was a bank right across the street, and they really weren't interested in myself unless I was buying a boat or a car and I was going to make payments. They didn't understand the business. 25 years you know, go by very quickly, unfortunately, and you find yourself looking around, proud of what you've built, but at the same time realizing there are new threats that, you know, besides what, unfortunately, you have to deal with on your plate on a macro level, which is mind-boggling, you know, we each have our own little niche. We also pay that health insurance for our employees, always did. I remember paying for an employee, said, what are my benefits? I said, you're going to get health insurance. You're going to get a profit-sharing possibility here. You're going to be able to grow with us. And the goal was lock up the person because you don't want people changing jobs. That insurance for that individual is $32, $32 a month, and I'd more than happily pick that up. Today, that amount is like $500. They don't even get the same level of service. They get all generics. They don't get the products. They don't get anything. I guess my commentary comes down to is as the government it gets more and more involved in business and get, gets more involved in taxes to pay for an awful lot of programs, what you're finding is you're strangling those job creation vehicles that are available. <clears throat> Excuse me. Give me one second. You're, you're sort of strangling the, you know, the engine that does create the jobs. We have jobs that we offer, I mean, regularly. There's always an opportunity for somebody who wants to work hard. I don't care what the background is. I don't care what the health level, what the education is, or or where they came from. But the fundamentals are profit, $250,000. Well, if you're two people in a family, that's not a lot. It seems like a lot, but not when you have the family, the kids, the cars, the college, and all the other things that go. Plus, you have to grow the engine. You have to grow it to continue to provide more jobs and to create the dream. Yeah, there's a lot of wealth, but it's trapped in the buildings, the 200,000 square feet. It's trapped in millions of dollars in inventory. It's trapped in accounts receivable, which can run millions of dollars. People that are saying, you know, I don't have it right now. I can't pay you. But the government comes along every quarter, and the tax checks do go out on imaginary profits that you hope you won't write off as bad debts at a year later, on things that really, from my perspective, are the thrills of owning a small business, you know, having the whole plate on a micro level that you would have and having to constantly keep the balls in the air. One of the things that concerns me is that repeal the Bush, quote, tax cuts. The repeal, I don't care if it's 5%. That's 5% that would create a job. 5% on millions of dollars of profit creates many jobs. Nobody's putting it in their pocket on a corporate level. They can sit with their piles of cash. But on a small business level, which is, you know, the essence of this country, and it is the foreign ambassador for countries around the world to meet us, when I go to China and I spend all my time, I have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. I sent an email out to all the people we do business with. I go, do you have any questions for our president? If I'm blessed and I have the opportunity to spend the four hours under the trees, I'd like to present your arguments. First one was from China. Why are you pressuring them for the renminbi? Why are you pressuring? All right, we're, 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 we're going way afield now. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, the, uh, so, so let me focus on, on your question. Uh, and, I, and I'll be happy to talk about it. And then if you want, I'll, I can tell you, you know, if, if you're making an argument on behalf of China about their currency, I'm happy to make uh, that argument uh, uh, to, to push back on that. But, but let me focus on the issue you raised about, about your business. And first of all, we're, you know, I'm thrilled that you've been able to build this success. Um, I have signed eight small business tax cuts since I came into office, and the package that we signed this week cut taxes in eight more ways. So 
Your taxes haven't gone up in this administration. Your taxes have gone down in this administration. So I, I just want to be clear about this because this is something that I know a lot of times, you know, uh, there, there's, there's, uh, you know, I just think the notion that, well, he's a Democrat, so your taxes must have gone up. Well, that, that's just not true. Taxes have gone down. For you, the small business person, and by the way, for 95% of working families. That was part of the Recovery Act, was reducing people's taxes. Now, with respect to the debate that's now taking place on the Bush tax cuts, keep in mind that uh, what we've proposed is to extend the Bush tax cuts for all income up to $250,000. So it's not just sort of the person who's making $60,000 who would get a tax break or who's making $100,000 who would make a tax break, who would get a tax break. If you're making $300,000, you'd still get a tax break on the first $250,000 worth of income. You'd pay a slightly higher rate on the $50,000 above that. If you make half a million dollars, you'd still be... Uh, having tax relief on the first half of your income, on the other half, above 250, you'd have a slightly higher rate. A rate, by the way, that is back to the level it was under Bill Clinton. At a time when there were a lot of small businesses and, in fact, the economy was doing much better. The reason I think it's important for us to do this is not because I'm not sympathetic to small businesses. It has to do with the fact that 98%, 98% of small businesses actually have a profit of less than $250,000. So it's not just individuals who generally don't make that much money. Most small businesses don't make that much money either. But it costs $700 billion. And so I've got to figure out, well, how do I pay for $700 billion? Because everybody's also concerned that our deficit's out of control. So then folks will say, well, let's cut government spending. Well, most government spending is Medicare, Medicaid, veterans funding, defense. I mean, you know, so when, you, when people look at the budget, a lot of times they say, well, you know, why don't you just cut out foreign aid, for example? Foreign aid is 1% of our budget. Not 25%, it's 1%. People say, well, why don't you eliminate all those earmarks, all those pork projects that members of Congress are getting out there. Now, I actually think that you know, a lot of that stuff needs to end, but even if I eliminated every single earmark a pork project by members of Congress, that's 1% of the budget. I mean, so finding $700 billion is not easy. And when we borrow $700 billion, we're adding to our deficit and debt, and then we've got to pay interest to China or whoever else is willing to buy our debt. So, so these are the choices. So it's not that, you know, when it comes to small businesses or big businesses that I have any interest in raising taxes. I'd like to keep taxes low so that you can create more jobs. But I also have to make sure that we are paying our bills and that we're not adding, putting off debt for the future generation. And that's what happened in the Bush tax cuts in 2001 and 2003. We lopped off taxes and we did not pay for it, and that is the single largest contributor to the debt and the deficit. It's not anything that we did last year is in emergency spending. It's not the auto bailout. It's not the health care bill. That's not what's added to our deficit. The single biggest reason that we went from a surplus under Bill Clinton to a deficit of record levels when I walked into office had to do with these Bush tax cuts because they weren't paid for and we didn't make cut. We didn't cut anything to match them up. So, so I think that to say to the top 2% of businesses, which, by the way, includes hedge fund managers who set up an S corporation but are pulling down a billion dollars a year, but, but they're still considered a small business under, <laughs> under the criteria that are set up there, that, that, that to say to them, 
you've got to pay a modestly higher amount to help make sure that our budget over time gets balanced. Uh, I think that's a fair thing to do. Um, and, I'd, and, and I think, uh, you know, when I talk to a lot of businesses, you know, they just don't want super high rates of the sort that existed, you know, before Ronald Reagan came into office. And I'm very sympathetic to that. And on, on, on capital gains and dividends, for example, you know, we want to keep those relatively level. We don't want, I would like to see a lower corporate tax rate. But the way to do that is to eliminate all the loopholes, because right now on paper we've got a high corporate tax rate, but in terms of what people actually pay, they've got so many loopholes that they've larded up in, in the tax code that effectively they pay very low rates. So this is a challenge, but I want to do everything I can to make sure that uh, your business succeeds. Um, I will say I'm, the reason that I'm pushing China about their currency is because their currency is undervalued. And that effectively means that their uh, goods that they sell here cost about 10% less, and goods that we try to sell there cost about 10%. Or uh, now, let, let me not say 10% because I don't, I don't want the financial markets to think I've got a particular. <laughs> there is a range of estimates, but I think people generally think that they are managing their currency in ways that make our goods more expensive to sell and their goods cheaper to sell here. And that contributes. That's not the main reason for our, our, our uh, trade imbalance, but it, it's a contributing factor to our trade imbalance. So, All right. Over here. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning. Um, I'm a proud Iowa social worker who works with crime victims. And my question is about the poverty rate. We currently have a rate of 14% poverty. That's one out of seven people are in poverty. And I believe that that's the highest rate since the 1960s. And there's a lot of reasons why people go into poverty who weren't in poverty before. You know, things like medical emergencies and losing jobs being a crime victim and, you know, especially for women, a divorce. Mm -hmm. My question is, what are we going to do, or I guess more specifically, what are you going to do, <laughs> to help one out of six or seven people get out of poverty? It's, it's, a, it's a profound question. I... I uh... The, the poverty rate, I think, is the highest it's been in 15 years. Um, it, it's still significantly lower than it was back in the 1960s. But it's, look, it's unacceptably high. Um, the single most important thing I can do to drive the poverty rate down is to grow the economy. You know, what, what has really uh, increased poverty is folks losing their jobs uh, and being much more vulnerable. So uh, everything we can do to provide you know, uh, tax breaks for small businesses that are starting up to make sure that uh, we are encouraging, for example, trying to accelerate investment in plants and equipment this year uh, and letting people write it off more quickly so that uh, – Companies that are on the sidelines that are thinking about investing, they say, you know what, why don't we go ahead and take the plunge now and start hiring now instead of later. All that can make a big difference uh, in terms of growing the economy, reducing the unemployment rate. That will reduce the poverty rate. The second most powerful thing I can do to reduce the poverty rate is improve our education system because uh, the, the, the single biggest indicator of poverty is whether or not you, you – graduated from high school and uh, you're able to get some sort of post-secondary education. And right now, too many of our schools are failing. So this week we spent a lot of time talking about the education reforms we've already initiated. As I said, uh, we, we set up something called Race to the Top. And it was a simple idea. The federal government sends education dollars to schools all across the country to help them 
particularly poor schools. But what we said is we're going to take a portion of that money, $4 billion, and we're going to say to the states, you're going to have a competition for this money. You're not automatically going to get it because of some formula. 